Hi, welcome back to The Basement. I'm Steve Lewis. And welcome back to our in-depth look at the year 1978. We're now up to the fourth quarter, October, November, and December of the year. There's a lot to get to here, and as I expected, there's more than we can really do in a single episode. I don't want to give short shrift to anything. There was just a lot, lot going on that will really be interesting to talk about, I think, in this quarter, so we'll split it into two episodes which means that this episode will be very light on Beach Boy content. We'll touch on what the Beach Boys were doing in the fourth quarter of the year in the next episode. Even that will be a little bit light because they weren't all that active, but we will talk about them more in the next episode than we do in today's episode. But let's talk about where we were pop culturally as the fourth quarter of the year began. The first record chart of the year came out on October 7th, and sitting as the number one album in the country was Boston's Don't Look Back album. At number two was the soundtrack for Grease. This had been number one for nine of the last ten weeks and would return to number one for three weeks the week after this. At its number three peak was Foreigner's Double Vision album. The Who's Who Are You album was at number four. This would go up to number two for two weeks beginning on October 21st. Again, this picture disc version came out somewhere in the fourth quarter. I'm not sure if it was actually out at the beginning of the quarter, but sometime in the fourth quarter was when we got the picture disc edition, and we will talk much more about picture discs in the next episode. At number five was the Rolling Stones' Some Girls album. This had gone to number one for two weeks in July. A Taste of Honey's self-titled album was at its number six peak. Kenny Loggins from Loggins and Messina was starting to have some major success with his Nightwatch album, which was at its number seven peak. The Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band soundtrack album was at number eight. This had spent six weeks at number five from August 19th through September 23rd. Blam! by the Brothers Johnson was at number 9. It had peaked at number 7 a week earlier. And at number 10 was Twin Sons of Different Mothers by Dan Fogelberg and Tim Weisberg with its number 24 hit, The Power of Gold. The album would peak at number 8 on October 21st. Interestingly, there were no albums in the top 10 that had been there three months earlier when the third quarter began. As the fourth quarter began, the top 10 singles in the country were at number 1, Kiss You All Over by Exile. Number two was A Taste of Honey's Boogie Oogie Oogie, which had hit number one on September 9th. Nick Gilder's Hot Child in the City was at number three. It would go to number one on October 28th. Boston's Don't Look Back single was at its number four peak. And Summer Nights by John Travolta, Olivia Newton-John, and the cast of Grease was at its number five peak. And number six was Reminiscing by the Little River Band. It would go to number three on October 28th. This took us back to a time when Glenn Miller's band was better than before. We yelled and screamed for more, which is something you'd have to be approximately in your mid-50s to really reminisce about in 1978. At the number seven spot was Olivia Newton-John's Hopelessly Devoted to You from Greece. It had been at number three a couple of weeks earlier on September 23rd. Love is in the air by John Paul Young was at number eight. It would go to number seven on October 14th. Anne Murray's You Needed Me was at number nine and would go to number one on November 4th. And Whenever I Call You Friend by Kenny Loggins featuring Stevie Nicks from Fleetwood Mac, his first big solo hit, was at number 10. It would reach number five on October 28th. Other top 10 singles that came and went in the fourth quarter included MacArthur Park by Donna Summer, which would hit number one on November 11th. It was a disco version of Richard Harris's number two hit from 10 years earlier, written by the great Jimmy Webb. This was the song that warned us of the dangers of leaving our baked goods exposed to the elements. Foreigner's Double Vision single would hit two also on November 11th, and How Much I Feel by Ambrosia would hit number three on November 11th. The Rolling Stones' Beast of Burden single would hit number eight on November 11th, and Get Off by Foxy would hit number nine on November 11th. You Never Done It Like That by The Captain and Tennille would hit number 10 on November 18th. Time Passages by Al Stewart would hit number 7 on December 9th. And Our Love, Don't Throw It Away by Andy Gibb would hit number 9 on December 16th. In music-related news, on October 12th, former Sex Pistol Sid Vicious was arrested for the murder of his girlfriend, Nancy Spungen. Turning to new albums, the fourth quarter is always a big time for new releases, and 1978 was no exception. We'll talk about some of the new releases in this episode and some of those fourth quarter new releases in the next episode. 
On October 2nd, the music world was shocked, shocked, to discover that the 12th Chicago album was not called Chicago 12. It was, in fact, called Hot Streets. This would eventually have two number 14 singles, Alive Again and No Tell Lover. Also released on October 2nd was Neil Young's excellent Comes a Time album. The cover showed us that times were changing and Neil Young had cut his hair. Also released in early October was Chaka by Chaka Khan. Its single, I'm Every Woman, would hit number 21 late in 78. And the debut self-titled album from Toto, whose single, Hold the Line, would hit number 5 late in 1978. October also saw the release of Aerosmith's double live bootleg album, and Billy Joel followed up his mega-successful The Stranger album with the even more mega-successful 52nd Street album. Elton John released A Single Man. In short order, Elton John had gotten rid of his band, his most flamboyant outfits, his glasses, and most notably, his co-writer, Bernie Taupin. At some point, I'd like to do maybe an episode talking about the Single Man album, the Ego single, and Elton John's sort of career trajectory here in the late 70s. I think that could make an interesting episode one of these days. Hope we'll get to that sometime. Released in November was You Don't Bring Me Flowers by Neil Diamond. Queen's follow-up to their big hit News of the World with Jazz. Eric Clapton's follow-up to his big hit Slow Hand with Backless. And a couple of greatest hits albums just in time for the holidays. The Best of Earth, Wind, and Fire, Volume 1. And Barry Manilow's Greatest Hits. Another notable album from this period was Let's Keep It That Way by Anne Murray. Out since February, the album hit in the fall of 1978 on the strength of You Needed Me, which was the number one single on November 4th. Turning to television on October 7th in a highly anticipated appearance, the Rolling Stones were the musical guests on Saturday Night Live. They played their latest single from the Some Girls album, Beast of Burden, as well as Shattered and Respectable. Unfortunately, as was often the case with rock music on TV at the time, the sound quality was terrible, and the band seemed ill at ease during the performance. Jagger did a nice appearance with Dan Aykroyd as Tom Schneider in a parody of The Tomorrow Show, and Ronnie and Charlie sat in at the Olympia Cafe for Cheeseburger, Cheeseburger, Cheeseburger. In retrospect, it's impressive that this far into their careers, the Stones were able to play just songs from their new album, and nobody seemed to complain about it. A week later, on October 14th, the Stones' classic Satisfaction got a workout on Saturday Night Live in a very unusual take by a very unusual new wave band from Akron, Ohio called Devo. Devo also performed their own number, Jocko Homo. Both tracks were featured on their debut album, Are We Not Men. It was another one of those strange, intriguing, polarizing new wave albums that began to appear in 1978. Of course, punk and new wave hadn't really gone away in 1978 and were making minor inroads into mass popularity with a lot of people debating what constituted punk and what constituted new wave. People would say things like, I don't like punk, but I like some of that new wave. In people's minds, it seemed that punk meant noise and safety pins, where new wave had something to do with skinny neckties and electric keyboards. Also confusing but intriguing was the fact that often the U.S. and U.K. versions of records differed, which is something we hadn't really seen much since the mid-60s. For example, Elvis Costello's second album, This Year's Model, which was released in March of the year, featured a different cover, slightly, from the UK version, and a different track lineup. Elvis Costello's producer, Nick Lowe's album, Jesus of Cool, was released also in March under the name Pure Pop for Now People, with a slightly different cover and also a different track lineup. Nick Lowe was what they called in England a pub rocker. We didn't really have that term here. He came out around 1978, so he basically got lumped in as being a new waver. Another new wave album released in March of the year was Patti Smith's Easter, which featured the hit Because of the Night, which went to number 13 in June of 1978. Now, sure, Because the Night was written by Bruce Springsteen, but you had to say that Patti Smith was at least a new waver, if not a punker, so this kind of was an inroad to some mass popularity. In June, we got the debut self-titled album by Boston New Waver's The Cars. Their single, Just What I Needed, would go to number 27 in September of 78. And in July, we got the second album from The Talking Heads, More Songs About Buildings and Food. 
Their single, Take Me to the River, would be in the top 40 by the end of 78 and would peak at number 26 on February 10th, 1979. In September, we got another great album from the Ramones called Road to Ruin for anybody that was really paying attention. November saw the release of the debut album by a band called The Police and their single, Roxanne. Roxanne only went to number 32 and didn't do it until April 28, 1979, but it caught a lot of people's attention because it sounded so different from anything else that was getting radio play at the time. Also released in November of 78 was the second album by The Clash, Give Em Enough Rope. Oddly, this was the first Clash album released in the U.S. Their debut album had been widely available as an import, but didn't get released in the U.S. until July of 1979, when it came out with a different track listing and a bonus single, Gates of the West and Groovy Times. This album included a cover of I Fought the Law, which actually got some radio play in the summer of 79, which is a rarity for a so-called punk band at the time. And finally, by December of 1978, John Lydon, the former Johnny Rotten of the Sex Pistols, was back with a new band, Public Image, and a new album, First Issue. There were some tentative successes for New Wave in 1978, but its influence was felt much more as we got into 1979. More about that in the next episode. Now getting back to television, which is where we started, the same night Devo made their appearance on Saturday Night Live, earlier that evening on NBC, one of the great unanswered questions in TV history began to be unraveled, which was, did the castaways ever get off Gilligan's Island? They were still on the island when the series went off the air in September 1967, leaving their fate open through all those syndicated reruns. On October 14th, the first of the two-part Rescue from Gilligan's Island began to give us some answers. The castaways with a different ginger finally returned to civilization. This being Gilligan's Island, however, they frustratingly end up stranded once again on the same island at the end of part two one week later on October 21st. And of course, it's all Gilligan's fault. On November 3rd came the premiere of an early mid-season replacement, a sitcom called Different Strokes, developed by Norman Lear's production company and featuring young Gary Coleman, who had scored in a guest role on Good Times. It was the story of a man, he's a man of means, who adopts two poor kids who've got nothing but their genes. It would run until 1986, asking the question, what you talking about, Willis, innumerable times. Five nights earlier, on October 28th, NBC broadcast KISS meets the Phantom of the Park. We'll want to devote at least a little bit of time to talking about that. So we'll leave it there for now. Hope you enjoyed this. Love to hear your comments. We'll see you next time for the thrilling conclusion of 1978. Thanks. Bye.